right, so, all right, uh, let us turn to the Word of God. Uh, Lydia's got the reading for us today. Our reading is from the book of James before we turn to Acts. If you'll find in your Bible, James 3.13, on page 1388, I believe, in your pew Bible. She's going to read you James 3.13 down to 18. Come up here. Thank you. Oh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by God conduct that his words are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have better every and self seeking in your hearts, do not boast and eat against the truth. The gift, the wisdom does not descend from above, but <coughs> in every se sensual de demonic. For where envy and self seeking exist, confusion and every and every and thing on there but the wisdom that is from above is first pure dear peace peace like gently willing yield full of nearly and good truth fruit without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit is righteousness is owned in peace by those who make peace. Bless the word of God. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we ask you now, Lord, that as we uh, continue in your scriptures, uh, that your uh, peaceableness and wisdom would be upon us. Uh, we bless your name, Lord, that we have your word to study. And we pray, Father, that as we face uh, challenging times and uh, difficulties, uh, that you would help us, Lord, know how to conduct ourselves aright for the sake of the glory of Jesus Christ. As we study, Lord, we ask for your Spirit's assistance in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you'll turn back to Acts 5, then, please. Acts 5, and we're going to pick up in verse 17. Uh, you'll recall last week, uh, on New Year's Day, uh, we looked at the short passage that came right after the uh, sort of fearful and stunning incident of Ananias and Sapphira's deaths. Uh, we had 12 to 16 last week in Acts 5. And the, uh, the young church was clearly full of the power of God. Uh, the word about Jesus Christ being exalted uh, by God to Prince and Savior as, as being unashamedly, boldly preached by those who witnessed his resurrection. Uh, God is authenticating their words by means of numerous undeniable miracles, right? power from above clearly evident in the Christian uh, gatherings. And last time we outlined the church's right relationships, if you'll remember, toward God, fear, worship, honor, obedience, toward one another, uh, loyalty, love, generosity, like-mindedness, and then of course toward those uh, on the outside, if you like, toward their countrymen, and really anyone who uh, inquired about what's this all about, Good works, goodwill, right? Encouragement to come and hear and come receive the Lord's salvation. So lots of um, miraculous, instantaneous healings are taking place, it says, at the hands of the apostles. These are uh, signs, they're signposts that the life of God is present here, right? Here is, in Christ, life more abundant given by God. And it said that multitudes were being added to the Lord. Okay, now remember there were some who respected the believers but didn't join them but there were many many others who did and the number is growing it said that the number, many were added to the lord 
Uh, but last week I mentioned that there is one other group of people in the picture to take into account. Um, these are some people who reacted very negatively to what God was doing in the young church. And so that brings us to Acts 5, 17. So if you'll read along, I'll just read you 17 and 18 for starters. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid hands, laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. Okay, filled with indignation, or uh, alternately jealousy. Uh, now that little uh, that thing was stated very briefly and without much detail, but I don't want it to get past you that uh, the high priest's response and the other Sadducees' response to dozens of miraculous healings. And, and their reaction to a spirit of widespread joy and unity and this overflowing generosity among literally thousands of Jews, uh, their reaction to this message of God's merciful, loving kindness, uh, to countless people turning away from sin and turning to God, uh, demons being driven out of people, and, and like the Sadducees' response to all of that is rage, indignation, and they send out their guards or officers or whoever, and they have all of the apostles, presumably all 12 of them, forcibly arrested and thrown into the dungeon. Okay, they are determined to stop this coal. Now, what can you call that but malice? Okay, so the apostles are locked up for, let's say, most of a day. All right, verse 19 then. Uh, but at night... An angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. Right? They resumed their teaching, just like they were doing before. Okay? Now the high priest and those who were with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel, and they sent to the prison at this the next morning to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prisons shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. And then someone came and told them, saying, Look, the men you put in prison are standing out in the temple and teaching the people. And the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. Now, you would like to have seen that, I bet. I'd like to have seen that. Uh, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Uh, so before we consider uh, you know, this other relationship, right? The, what is the, the, what the apostles' behavior, how do they respond to this uh, on this occasion? And in particular, Peter's words, I want to first try to get a handle on this attitude of indignation. Why such a heated response? It doesn't seem reasonable, does it? You know, how is it possible that all of these wonderful things and, and changed lives, you know, people humbling themselves and receiving forgiveness, you know, could, how could that all take place so openly and publicly and yet manage to provoke such a hostile reaction? Now, this goes back to Jesus himself, right? God's power was so obviously on display around Judea, but, you know, here you had these people, right, men who consider themselves very, well, righteous, godly, uh, religious, who hated him. What's to hate? Right? Even Pontius Pilate, who's a pagan, you know, he's flabbergasted by these men. What is it that you have against him? Why? What has he done? What crime? What do you object to? 
Okay, so this is something that one of the commentators called the irrationality of unbelief. Okay, and by irrational, he means that people who refuse to believe in Christ refuse uh, not because they've carefully taken in all of the data and have thought things over very sort of uh, dispassionately and they, you know, reason and logic have led them to the conclusion that no, this is not real and not worth my time. You know, Jesus was an imposter. Faith in Jesus is a harmful thing. It makes people into slaves. Uh, the whole thing is against God. It's counterfeit. It's an offense to goodness, things like that. No, people don't reject Jesus based on that kind of logic. Right? It's actually not possible to reject Jesus based on logic because the actual facts support the gospel. Right? Anybody who could have impartially observed the things that took place in those days without prejudice would have agreed this is the hand of God. This is God. Right? This is, right? the, that's what the evidence shows. Jesus' own works and then the works of his apostles. Right? The stuff going on here is supernatural. And you can't reason your way around that. And there's no other conceivable uh, explanation. Right? This Jesus that we heard preach in our towns, and we saw him heal so many, and now these men testify to, must indeed be the savior of the world. Like that's, that's, that's only logical, that's rational, that's what the facts show. And if a person was rational, they would accept Christ, right? So there's something irrational about unbelief, right? There's something that, even though presented with all of this facts, evidence, and testimony, says, so what? I don't care. Now, I've heard some of you uh, say that you've tried to present Christ to some friend or family member, and the response you get has been, not this again. You know, I don't want to hear it. Some very strong negative reply. Right? Or, or maybe they're very polite about it, but they still make it clear, you know, I'm not interested in hearing it. I'm not, I'm not talking about this. Well, why don't you want to talk about it? Why don't you want to hear it? I mean, I could understand if, if I was trying to get you to believe in, like, Rumpelstiltskin. You know, this is a kid's story, everybody. Like, I'm not, like, if I was trying to make you believe in Superman, you know, you really ought to believe in Superman. He's got all these awesome powers, and, you know, you would be amazed at what he can do. He's the product of somebody's mind, right? And that would be rational to say, look, you know, there's no need for me to believe in Superman. You can actually do just a very little bit of homework and find out when and where he was invented and by whom. And, like, this is a kid's story. You know, it's not real, and I don't have to believe it. That would be rational. That's never what you get, though, from people who don't believe the gospel. What you get is something that has nothing to do with reason and logic and facts at all. It goes against reason. It's irrational. Something else is in there that overrides uh, the force of reason. Okay, now look at this passage again. Is reason how you would describe the way these Sadducees are behaving? Not at all, right? Do you see them? They're not trying to tell the apostles that, guys, you're out of your minds. You're delusional. None of this ever happened, right? You've made this whole thing up. There's no healings. I don't know what you're doing, but it's some kind of magic trick or some kind of like carnival sideshow thing. You know, are you trying to get rich off of this? Are you some kind of con artist? You know, can't you see that by lying to people like this, you're provoking God to anger? No. There's nothing like that in the Sadducees. There's never an accusation that the apostles are lying. There can't be such an accusation because it's all being done right out in plain sight. It's all out in the open. Okay? Remember how this thing unfolded before this. Uh, the first time the Sadducees intruded was after the man at the beautiful gate. You remember the lame man? Uh, he's walking and leaping and praising God. Okay? They accosted Peter and John and said, What's going on here? What gives? But they, among themselves, they admitted, this is an incredible miracle, and we can't deny it, right? But we have to stop it. We have to prevent it from going further. Well, why? How is that being reasonable? You know, what's your motive for saying, we have to stop this? What is a person's motive for saying, I don't want to hear it? You keep that to yourself. Okay, and of course, that's hardly anything compared to what 
some Christians in different places around the world might get. You know, in some places, Christians are, you know, churches are burned down, smashed to pieces. You know, the people are shot, they're blown up, they're kidnapped, they're arrested. You know, groups make it their mission to eradicate uh, the, the name of Jesus and the faith of Jesus from their part of the world. And you say, why? What has he done? What do you have against him? You know, what is it that you hate so viciously? Is it the singing? Is it the praying? Is it the, the, the generosity? Is it the word salvation? You know, when did salvation become a, a bad word? Okay, here in what's, I suppose, less wild of a country, but it's only because you don't have much actual violence, there's still the same spirit, though, of, of indignation or spitefulness. Okay, people, you will hear them speak about Christ and Christians in the most degrading, insulting ways. Okay, people act, they act as if they're, well, we're just too educated now to believe in something like old-fashioned, primitive like this, but that's not how they talk about Christ. You know, as if, it, as if he's just a, um, an old-fashioned theory that everybody knows better now. Um, so, for example, you know, there used to be the belief that you could tell a person's character qualities and personality by the shape of their skull. And that was, a, you know, that was a medical field. Well, everybody knows that's nonsense now. Nobody believes it. It's been thoroughly debunked. Okay, but people don't get, like, hot under the collar about it. You know, you don't get indignant about somebody, you know, if somebody say, you know, I believe that, you could be very rational and you know, all you could say is, look, let's look at some evidence and I can show you very easily there's no correlation between the bumps in your skull and what you're like. Nobody believes this anymore. But you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't get hot about it. You wouldn't get angry. And if somebody knocked on my door and they said, you know, I want you to believe in Superman or Hercules or somebody like that, I'm not going to get angry at you, except that you made me come to the door, but um, you know, it's, you really should believe the earth is flat. Well, no, okay, it's not something, it's silly, but I'm not going to get angry about it. But when the subject is Jesus, why is there so much antipathy and scorn? You know, if he's so obviously a story and so easily disproven, then why do people get so worked up against him? So obviously something more visceral is going on there than just your your intellect, you know, my rational, or my, my reason, okay? So for example, uh, why does somebody feel it's necessary to expend the effort to file a lawsuit to have a uh, Beelzebub goat god thing uh, installed in the state house next to the Ten Commandments? Why, why do that? Why invest your energy in that? Okay, that's clearly a dig. Like, it's meant to be an insult. It's meant to be hurtful uh, and vindictive to Christians. Uh, you know, we have our Good News Club. So why are there people trying to start elementary school Satan clubs as a counterbalance, if you like, to the Good News Club? Like, it's obviously meant to be mean-spirited. You know, nobody, most people don't believe that kids should worship Satan, but it's obviously meant to be an insult to Christianity. Okay, and so people are talking about now Christians should not be allowed to uh, participate in the political process. You know, there's people who celebrate uh, when a, a famous Christian dies and they say all kinds of nasty and mean things uh, and, and vulgarities about, you know, this Christian who just died. Um, Bible believer. Is, is it, why is that an insult? Call somebody a Bible, you know, it's right up there with like redneck and, and uh, crackpot. You know, you're a Bible believer. And, and it's said with venom and spite and negativity, that shows you that it's not reason that's operating here. It's something more animal, something more visceral. Okay, and surely if it wasn't for the fact that we have better law enforcement in our country than in some other places, there would not be that much hindering the same kind of brutality against Christians here that you find elsewhere. And you say, why though? What has he done? What crime did he commit? You know, what is it that gets under your skin? Why must you shut this down or shut it up? Okay. If it was just a matter of whether it was true or not, 
The Sadducees never would have acted the way that they did if it was all fake. This would have been very easy for them to deal with. The problem they have is it's all true. And there's not a thing they can do to change that. And they hated the fact that it was true. And they took that as a threat to their own power. And they hated, really what they hated is that an authority greater than their own had the nerve to act without their permission and apart from their little structure. Okay, and here's what it comes down to. And here's what gets under people's skin and why they demean Christ and why they say, don't come around here with that. It's a refusal to yield up personal authority, personal autonomy. If Jesus was really a charlatan and a fake and a phony or a legend, well, who, who even cares? You know, he, he makes no impact on my life. You know, it's like Hercules. He has no impact on my life. I don't even have to, like, give you the time of day about it. Okay, I have, I, I'm free to make whatever choice I want, whenever I want, about anything I want. So here's these men, they're in authority. If you like, they manage Israel, right? They set the practices and standards. They're the ones who deal with the Romans. You know, ostensibly they say, well, God is supreme or he's over us. But in practicality, they speak for God, right? God does what we say God does. And the nerve of somebody to bypass our authority, my autonomy, and, and that, that can't be tolerated. That has to be um, shut down. So here's the indignation, right? How dare they? At that point, you've left the realm of reason. Okay, like I said, it's much more animalistic. It's, you know, it's not intellectual. It's something in the guts, I guess you could say in the heart. And, and I suppose the word for it is pride. But, you know, what it really comes down to is self, you know, myself. How dare they ignore me, whatever it is that dares to bypass me or overrule me, has to be shut down post-haste. Okay, and that's why people will lash out with um, ridicule and attacks and vulgarities. You know, you've got to knock this down, you've got to smash it down. And that's why they lay hold of people and lock them up and put them away. It's to shut them up. And it's why around the world and down through history, there's been so much actual violence against Christians. It's simply because we acknowledge, and, and just it's really just merely pointing out the fact that God has authority, right? That God's authority exists and that it takes a certain shape and form, namely his word, his son. Okay, we didn't make any of this up. We're just, really, we're accessories to the fact. You know, we're just witnesses to it. That God exists, and as God, by definition, he has authority. And as God, he can decide in what way he's going to manifest that authority and bring it to bear. He decides how he's going to bless and by what channels. Okay, and how much sense does it make for us to be down here sort of grinding our teeth about it with indignation and saying, how dare he? Right, but that's only reasonable that, you know, as the supreme being, that we allow him, if allow is a suitable word, if we allow him to be the supreme being. Okay, we don't allow him, that's what supreme means. He's over us, right? So we don't say, how dare he? Don't come around here with that stuff, I don't want to hear it. I don't, mean, I don't get it. You don't want to hear how the supreme being has pity on his little creatures. You don't want to hear about his fatherly loving kindness, how he gives us all kinds of good things, even though we're stubborn little cusses. How, how he makes a way for us to, to know him and find out about him. He offers us a share in, in what he's going to create. You don't want to hear how he gave us a son, a wonderful counselor, to give us encouragement and guidance and, and rescue us out of this awful swamp that we made for ourselves. I don't, I don't see what part of that is hateful. I don't see what part of that deserves contempt or attack. Do you oppose people finding out about God and having peace with God? Do you oppose people leaving their lives of sin? Did you want people to sin more? Right? Do you oppose the idea of uh, uh, people loving each other and caring, caring for each other and cleaning their lives up and praising God? Okay, but for some reason, people do despise that. Okay, so here's where the high priests and the Sadducees, they put their foot down 
They have the apostles locked up, and you know it's, it's so ironic. You know they expect to bring them out in the morning and give them a piece of their mind. We run the show around here, and then they go and lock the cell, and they find out they don't run the show around here after all. Okay, and they have to go out, you know, sort of politely and say, "Can you please come this way so that we can yell at you in here?" You know, but this, even after seeing that, the self still doesn't yield. Okay, the how dare you continues. And Peter's saying we have to obey God rather than men. It means nothing to them because they're the men, right? They're the ones not being obeyed. And nothing dares do that to me. Nothing can overrule the self. My self cannot give way for anything. Even though the evidence persuades tons of people, right? Even though it's beyond obvious at this point, I'm going to be my own authority. God will do God will do what I say he's going to do, right? He's going to behave according to my preferences, okay? You're determined to bring this man's blood on us, they say. Well, you shed his blood, didn't you? Okay, it sounds like you're determined to not be held responsible for what you did. So you see, we're, we're outside of the realm of reason now. We're in, a re we're in a realm where the self must dominate and prevail. The self is supreme. Okay, nobody better ever dare call me guilty. Nobody ever dare tell me God has said. Nobody's going to take away my standing as, as the boss around here. Okay, and that's how they reacted with Jesus. At first, very suspiciously, eventually, violently. How dare you bypass our tradition? How dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath day? How dare you teach us about God? Okay, we are the teachers around here. And now more of the same, right? Signs and wonders, how dare you? Right? Telling people Jesus has been raised from the dead, how dare you? Telling people that God forgives their sins, how dare you teach something other than we approve? Okay, that's our turf, that's our ground, right? Salvation is what we decide. Okay, and so that's how it is with the hostile person in general. Righteousness, I will decide what righteousness is. Right, salvation, I'll decide what salvation is. I don't even need to be saved. I'm good. Okay, and sin, I'll make up my own mind as far as what sin is and what's not. Okay, that's indignation. Okay, and then despite, when despite their indignation, God persists in being himself and upholding his own law and exalting his own son, that indignation turns to fury unless... Unless at some point the man comes to his senses and realizes that, wait, yes, it's perfectly reasonable to let God be God. It's completely logical to, to yield the floor to someone greater than myself, to a greater authority, and to acknowledge that I'm lesser, God is greater, and he never needed to ask my permission or my consent to do pretty much anything he wants. Okay, it's not impossible for someone who's like this to have a complete turnaround. Right, all things are possible with God, right? And in fact, now we haven't met him yet in the book of Acts, but this is exactly the sort of man that Saul of Tarsus was. Right, he's a man who at first and for a long time was indignant, righteously indignant as he saw it, uh, about the disciples of Jesus and, and their message. He was very much the sort of man who would say, how dare you people do this? Don't come in here with that. These people ought to be locked up. They need to be shut down, right? He was all in favor of having them actually removed altogether from Jewish society. Does that ring a bell? Okay, I never want to hear this Jesus business again. I wish people would stop talking about him. I wish you'd get rid of the whole thing. But you know what? Later in life, you find him saying, once I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent, arrogant man. Indeed, I myself was convinced I must do everything possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even chased them down to foreign cities. But the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant and he made an example of me in the best way imaginable, right? He made, 
He made me an example of his immense patience so that in me, of all people, such a sinner, that Christ Jesus might display his perfect love as an example for anyone in the future who might put their trust in him and also receive everlasting life. Uh, you know the song, we went, we went down to the uh, uh, New Year's Eve thing at the Nazarene Church. Uh, they sang the song, I Saw the Light. You know the song, Hank Williams' song, I Saw the Light. Where does that come from? That comes from him. Right? Saul literally saw the light, saw the blazing light. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why this indignation? Why this prejudice, this blasphemy? Open your eyes. Use your head. Let God be God. Right? Let him show you his salvation, his righteousness. Not what you think it's supposed to be, but what it is. And yes, that makes perfect sense. Right? It's perfectly rational when you look at the facts, when you look at the works of Jesus and the works of his apostles, and you see the power of God that was present. What was I thinking? Uh, it's like I was blind, but now I see. Right? Myself was in the way. You know, I couldn't see the truth around my own big fat head. Right? But now, but now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, use your reason. Step outside of yourself for a moment and see the thing that God has done. He sent his son so that in him you might have peace with God and you might know him and walk with him. Well, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for uh, our instruction today. Thank you, Lord, for a lesson from your word. And Father, we pray for your grace and mercy to be upon those that we know that are hard-hearted and indignant and who oppose your word. There are those that we love, Lord, we just want them to see the light, to open their eyes. And we need you to do that, dear Father, uh, to shine the light, the light of pure gospel truth. Help us, Lord, ourselves uh, to realize that you are our king and our authority and that we owe you our allegiance and our obedience. And we do rejoice, Lord, that you have caused us to see the good news of Jesus Christ in all of his perfections, excellencies, and beauty. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for our so great salvation and for the promises that we have. Please continue to teach us through your Holy Spirit. Please continue to form uh, in us that which is pleasing in your sight, in all good uh, conscience, good character, good conduct. And uh, we, we praise you, Lord Jesus, that um, you're going to use us to uh, bring others into your kingdom. We ask you, Father, that you would add more to the Lord. Uh, through our word, our testimony, and our good works. Uh, please, Father, give us the strength to uh, be good disciples. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.